Good morning. Um, for those of you who have not picked up your graded midterm or your graded paper, they're here. Pick them up. I'm tired of schlepping them into every class. If they're not picked up today, I'll just assume that you never attended class uh, and throw them away. But we worked so hard on them. I hate to have you not see what we did. Uh, so today, more on injurious speech, speech that hurts people, and the extent to which it may be protected by the uh, First Amendment. And we'll today look at two kinds of injurious speech. Um, one that the government believes injures women, uh, and the other that the government believes injures kids. Um, that is pornography and violent video games. And the uh, American booksellers case is the pornography case and uh, has a lot of fascinating issues. Back in the early 1980s, there was a movement afoot by feminist scholars and activists to eliminate pornography that, in their view, degraded women, uh, sexist pornography that treated women as sexual objects subordinate to the desires of men, that portrayed women as enjoying pain and humiliation and so on. The movement was uh, led by Professor Catherine McKinnon, a law professor at the University of Michigan, uh, who wrote a book and several thoughtful scholarly articles taking this position about pornography, that it injured women and resulted in men using, hard to say reading the pornography, but using the pornography, led to thoughts in men that resulted in harm to women. Uh, and the movement was also led by uh, Andrea Dworkin, who was a feminist um, activist. And they argued that materials like Hustler magazine, seems to figure in some of these cases, um, that those materials portrayed women as enjoying pain. Uh, and this pornography actually caused uh, discrimination against women in the home, led to domestic abuse uh, in the workplace where they didn't advance uh, or weren't hired, um, and that these depictions of subordination tended to per perpetuate uh, sexual stereotypes and the subordination of women, that this kind of pornography affects thoughts, uh, and thoughts affect behavior. The rationale of their efforts to legislate against pornography was that pornography causes harm and that pornographers ought to be held legally responsible for the harm that they cause. Uh, and as a remedy, uh, Professor McKinnon uh, and Andrea Dworkin drafted a, an ordinance, a city ordinance, that could be adopted by any city. They actually managed to get the city of Indianapolis to adopt their ordinance. It was an ingenious solution that treated pornography as sex discrimination. Sex discrimination is already illegal, uh, and they, under this ordinance, would treat pornography as sex discrimination. So if you've been injured by, you know, you've been discriminated against in the workplace, for example, on the ground of gender, you can sue the wrongdoer. Similarly, if you've been injured in some way by the pornography, uh, it has caused you injury in some way, uh, you can sue the pornographer. The ordinance is set forth in the decision that's in the reader. It defines pornography as the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women, whether in pictures or in words, that includes one of six elements. For example, number one, women are presented as sexual objects who enjoy pain or humiliation. Or, in another instance, uh, their sexual objects were tied up, or cut up, or mutilated, or bruised, or physically hurt. Um, these kinds of graphic images, sexually explicit, are the illegal pornography under this ordinance. Um, notice that, as the court points out in the case, that pornography is different from obscenity, which we've encountered before and we will encounter again. Obscenity, legally, is defined by the decision in Miller versus California, and in order for material to be considered legally obscene, it has to meet all three parts of the Miller test. The material must appeal to the prurient interest, the interest in sexual arousal. Uh, second, the depictions of sexual acts in the material must be patently offensive, as judged by community standards. And third, the material must lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Notice that none of those elements is included within the definition of pornography under the Indianapolis ordinance. Pornography is not a legal term. It just means material that is sexually titillating. Uh, and there's no settled legal definition of pornography. Well, uh, under the Indianapolis Ordinance, they did attempt a definition of pornography that subordinates women. Uh, that's what's set forth in the ordinance, and it includes none of the three elements of Miller versus California's obscenity test. So the material not, need not appeal to the prurient interest. Uh, it may not be patently offensive in its depiction of sexual acts and so on, and it may well have serious literary, artistic, or other value under this ordinance, and it would still be illegal, which obviously uh, causes some problems. Um, the rationale for prohibiting obscenity is not that it causes harm to anybody. It's rather that it's offensive to civilized society. Uh, while the rationale under the Indianapolis Ordinance for prohibiting pornography is that it, in fact, causes harm to women. So maybe that accounts for uh, some of the differences between the two. Um, let's look again at, uh, at this Hustler cover. This was at a point when uh, Larry Flint had recovered and said he was going to go straight. Uh, he was not going to um, 
degrade women with um, the images that he put in Hustler. Is this obscene? This image? Yes? Yes? Because... It what? Pretty obscene. Under what standards? Yours? Your personal standards, yeah, but is it legally obscene? Ruby? Like pieces of meat. That's the message that this conveys? You're willing to see irony in all the secret places. Yeah. Lindsay? It's a satire? What's it satirizing? He's sort of st- and, and therefore it has artistic value, so it's not obscene under Miller. Does it appeal to the prurient interest? It must, under the Miller test. Does this turn anybody on? <laughs> That's the test, basically. I don't, you don't have to raise your hand. Um, is its depiction of sexual acts, first, is this a depiction of a sexual act? Mm, it's a bit of a stretch, it seems. What, you what? Well, it has to be realistic. Yeah. Um, but the, the test is, is it a patently offensive depiction of sexual acts. And I think that would be a stretch. No, this is probably not, uh, wouldn't be considered obscene any place. Um, what about um, the Dixie Chicks picture? Is that obscene? They're all naked. Angelica? This one is protected as yeah. having political or, and artistic value? Yeah. What, what makes this political? Well, maybe in the context that this was in the magazine for like, what they tried to do. Th- this happened to have been a cover of Entertainment Monthly or Weekly or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah, Natalie Maines, the lead singer for the Dixie Chicks, had um, been very vocally critical of George W. Bush and the invasion of Iraq. And they were basically blacklisted and boycotted by many segments of the music business to punish them for criticizing President Bush. And this photograph was a response to that. It was a political statement by itself. And then, it, I mean, what gives it protection, in my view, is that it actually says free speech on somebody's body. Um, appeal to the prurient interest? No, probably not. Predominant appeal to the prurient interest, probably not. naked women, some, you know, might appeal to somebody's prurient interest. Uh, patently offensive in its depiction of sexual acts, no, and arguably has artistic and political value, so it is probably not obscene. Um, the ordinance, however, doesn't require obscenity, uh, and the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in the American Booksellers case finds the ordinance unconstitutional as a violation of the First Amendment. Um, pornography that meets the requirements of the ordinance, that subordinates women, uh, must be tolerated. How many agree with the result in that case? With the result in the case that the law is unconstitutional. So far we've got one, two. How many disagree with the result in that case? And, and the rest of you, the non-voters, is this a confession that you haven't done your homework? How can you take no position on this? Now that you are knowledgeable First Amendment experts, uh, you can either say, yes, this was a correctly reasoned decision that came to the correct result, or the court missed the boat and this was wrong. Nicole? Well, what was wrong with this ordinance? What was its constitutional flaw? Nick? Prior restraint? Well, how's it different from a criminal law? In this case, the, the uh, remedy for violating the thing was a $1,000 civil penalty for having violated the law. Some, come in. The law is content-based. In what sense? Well, if it's content-based, then what? What follows from strict scrutiny would follow from being, if the restriction in the law is content-based, it's a restriction based on the content of the speech, that triggers strict scrutiny. Does the court apply strict scrutiny in this case? Why not? Sorry? You would have, yeah. Well, you might have come out the other way then. Let's, let's look at it as a strict scrutiny analysis. Government has to show compelling interest and narrow tailoring. And doesn't the government have a compelling interest in preventing the discrimination against women, the subordination of women? Isn't that a valid, indeed, compelling government interest? Yeah. So you're saying the government doesn't have a compelling interest? Everybody agree with that? The government doesn't have a compelling interest? Alina? I can't hear. What are you telling us about whether the government has a compelling interest? Not enough, not a compelling interest. 
assume for a moment that protecting women from this kind of ugly, subordinating, injurious pornography is a compelling interest. Is the law narrowly tailored to serve that interest? So you. Mm. Yeah, over inclusive because it doesn't have the social value out of, a, of the obscenity text. And the court certainly points that out, saying that we don't know, we can't tell whether this ordinance, for example, would make James Joyce in some of his novels illegal, or Homer's Iliad, which has some scenes in which women are portrayed as subordinate and enjoying pain and so on. Um, the court does not quarrel with the McKinnon Dworkin thesis that pornography causes harm. It accepts the premises of the thing that depictions do tend to perpetuate subordination, including discrimination on the job, including domestic violence, even including rape. And the court says that simply demonstrates the power of pornography as speech. Even mentions, by way of historical example, the Sedition Act, where President Adams was honestly convinced, and the Federalists were convinced, that the fragile new democracy could be subverted by undermining respect for government in the Republican press, critical of the government. They really believed that. Uh, and yet the Sedition Act um, is now viewed as unconstitutional. Uh, the court says if, if it's enough that words affect deeds, and that means government can suppress the words, that's the end of freedom of speech. Well, go back to why the statute, why the ordinance was unconstitutional. Yes, the court says it was content-based, but no, the court does not apply strict scrutiny. And the reason was, this is even worse than a content-based restriction. It's viewpoint-based. That is, um, it discriminates on the grounds of the viewpoint of the speech. Speech that treats women in the approved way, approved by the government, the ordinance, the mckinnon Dworkin point of view, speech that treats women in the approved way, as premised, maybe it's sexual acts, but they're premised on equality, is lawful no matter how sexually explicit the material is. But speech that treats women in the disapproved way, as submissive or enjoying humiliation, is unlawful no matter how significant its literary, artistic, or other qualities are. That's worse than content-based. That's one step beyond. It's viewpoint-based. It's government taking sides on what ideas will be allowed in society and which will be proscribed or outlawed. There's no need to apply strict scrutiny if it's a viewpoint discriminatory law. That is what the court called thought control, violating the First Amendment principle that we have the right to express our opinions, even those that the government finds wrong or even hateful. And you know, we should remember Brandenburg here, the right to advocate even hateful, wrong ideas. Um, and the court says, yeah, well, the Klan was, is permitted to promulgate these awful ideas uh, that have no societal value. Um, the communists are entitled to advocate the over overthrow of the American government. Uh, the American Nazi Party was allowed by the First Amendment to conduct a march into Skokie, Illinois, which was uh, heavily inhabited by survivors of the Holocaust. Um, and the, the court uh, recalls even the Barnett case, the Jehovah's Witnesses case on the flag salute, uh, and quotes Justice Jackson in that, if there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it's that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith in those things. Um, the city of Indianapolis said to the court, yeah, but this is not political speech. Uh, Hustler magazine is simply appealing to male fantasies. Uh, non-political fantasies, and uh, this is low-value speech. It's not core political speech that commands uh, the highest degree of First Amendment protection. And the court has two answers for that. Um, look, you, city, you proponents of this kind of legislation, um, you can't say it's low-value speech and at the same time allege that this majorly influences social relations. It's powerful speech, not low-value speech. And even if you say that it's, yeah, it's not core political speech, you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. For example, you couldn't have a law that outlaws profanity or fighting words uttered about Republicans, but not Democrats. That would be viewpoint discrimination. 